Hi, good evening. Good to be with you again and around the word of Almighty God. Remember, we are looking and studying the book of Revelation. What an exciting book it is. Today we are going to chapter 7. And we are going to look there at the ceiling of the 144,000. And we're going to delve into that. So we want to thank God today for his goodness and for his mercies and love. Father, in Jesus' name, we look to you this, e this uh, evening. We pray your blessings upon your word. We pray that you would feed our souls with the bread of life. Give us, Lord God, uh, an appetite for truth. And may we, Lord God, pour over your word. And may we drink of your word. It's meat indeed. It's uh, food indeed. Uh, we thank you because your word enriches us. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, amen. And so we go to the book of Revelation chapter 7. And chapter 7 represents here uh, an interlude, yeah, uh, a parenthesis between John's vision of the six and seven seals. And of course, he sees two visions. And they are distinct from the result of the sixth seal. And having been broken, and prior to the breaking of the seventh uh, seal, John's first vision focuses on the number of those from the tribe of Israel, 144,000, who are marked with the seal of the living God. That's chapter 7, 1 to 8. And of course, his second vision, John's second vision, focuses on a great multitude clothed with white robes uh, before the throne. John 7 and 9 through 17. So we begin, and you can make this heading, right? Winds of judgment held back, right? He's talking about winds of judgment that is held back. Chapter 7, 1 to 3, and I read, And after this thing, John said, I saw four angels, standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea. Notice that. Nor on any tree. And I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So you note that. And as I told you, make a head in there. And the head in so certainly would be winds of judgment held back and notice that after these things right it means after the vis the visions that accompanied there right you notice that that, that vision that accompanied the, the 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 ceiling right the first six seals yeah, there may have been uh, a period of time before the vision of the following interlude. And so in the first of these two visions of the interlude, John sees four angels standing on four corners of the earth, powerfully holding back the four winds of the earth. And of course, they presented any strong destruction of the earth. So they were there to hold back 
any destruction of the earth. But it is the calm before the storm. And I guess you have heard that saying already, it's the calm before the storm. So the four corners of the earth is figurative. Note that. It's figurative language. In fact, Job reminds us that God uh, hung the earth upon nothing. Job 26 and verse 7. And Isaiah saw the Lord sitting above the circle of the earth. Isaiah 40 and verse 22. So John sees another angel, a fifth angel, uh, sending from the east or from the rising of the sun. In fact, Solomon's temple faced the east. The east speaks of the uh, Orient. Ezekiel saw the glory departing from the temple by way of the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city. Ezekiel chapter 43, in verse number 2, and you compare it to uh, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. So my friends, it seems that this angel coming from God comes from the east, it seems. And so the angel uh, carries the seal of the living God, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. And people in John's day were familiar with the authority of uh, a king's seal. And this seal is greater, much greater, that John is writing about here. This seal or signet is the seal of the living God. And by this seal, uh, of course, individuals are identified as belonging to him, being under his care, being under his protection. And so the angel from the east bears the seal of the living God with authority. He tells the angels to do what? To hold back the winds until we have, a, of course, have sealed the servants of God and they are not to injure or they are not to hurt. Not to injure, not to hurt, not to damage the earth, the sea or the trees. Remember we read that. So the angels are told not to hurt, not to damage the earth, the sea or the trees. And these four angels are messengers of God's divine judgment. So these four angels are messengers of God's divine judgment. And who is this? Who is this we? And unless the angel given the command, of course is including the angels, he is talking to, right? The servants of God may be translated slaves. Right, the Greek word doulos, right, it means slaves, not servant. But Paul uh, said he had been taken captive by the risen Christ, right? Acts chapter 9, verse 3 to 6, and you compare it in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, then you drop down to verse 11. So he was delighted to call himself, that's Paul, uh, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was delighted to call himself the Lord's slave. And this ceiling identified the time, of course, about, uh, which of course is above, uh, about God's and, and God who would do it, sir, who was subject to him about those slaves of God who were subject to him. And so his command, ready to carry out God's will, Ezekiel 9, verse 2 to 6. It seems that the sealing on the forehead uh, would be accompanied uh, 
of course, by the New Testament sealing, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, with the uh, outward evidence of speaking in other tongues. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. So even in Old Testament times, when God gave an outward sign, He also gave the inward reality. So the outward sign, inward reality. Samuel anointed David with the outward sign of the holy anointing oil. The Holy Spirit came upon uh, David from that day uh, forward, the word of God said, and upward, for it was uh, a, a growing, and not only a growing, but a continuous appearance. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. And of course, the reality of the Spirit seal it should be uh, expected. You should be expected here. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. So those sealed must escape the wrath. Those that were sealed must escape the wrath. You can make another heading. 12,000 sealed from each tribe. And I'll read from verse 4 to 8. And hear what it says. And I heard a number of them which were sealed. Mm -hmm. And there were, and of course, there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the throne of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of God was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000. Verse 7. And of the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. And verse 8 of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. So I said, you make another head in which is 12,000 sealed from each tribe, chapter 7, as we read in verse 4 to 8. So after the slaves of God are sealed, John hears their number. What is their number? 144,000 that had came from every tribe of Israel. Note that they were Israeli tribes, and every tribe of Israel. Not every person who claims descent from Israel or membership in one of the tribe is sealed. Uh, you notice that only some. So I want to repeat that. Not everyone who claims descendant from Israel or membership in one of the tribes is sealed. It's only some of them. So on what basis are they chosen and sealed? I'm asking a question. On what basis are they chosen and sealed? Some believe that, of course, they are the first fruits of a final revival. Others note that Ephraim is referred to as Joseph, right? And Levi is included, and Dan is left out. To some, uh, right? The loss is, is, is uh, of course, the list is symbolic and it refers to the church, right, as the Israel of God. But even though Christian believers are spiritual sons of Abraham, if they share the faith of Abraham, 
the church has never called the sons of Israel. Note that, please. Nor is it ever divided into tribes. So they're never called the sons of Israel, and they are never divided into tribes. Right? In the church, all former divisions are meaningless. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. The New Testament does recognize the Jews as the twelve. Luke chapter 22 and verse 30, Acts 26 and verse 7, and James 1 verse 1. Anna the prophetess was of the tribe of Asher, one of the ten northern tribes. Luke chapter 2 and verse 36, Acts chapter 26 and verse 7 speaks of all the Jews as our tribes. So it speaks of all the Jews as our tribe. As there you have it. And these are 144,000 mm, believing Jews. They're sealed for service. So these 144,000 uh, believing Jews are sealed for service. Judah, the tribe of Jesus Christ, is mentioned first. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn, but lost his right due to sin. And so the birthright went to Joseph in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, 1 and 2. But the leadership went to Judah because of spiritual strength. The leadership went to Judah because of spiritual strength. And he offered himself as a substitute for Benjamin. Genesis chapter uh, 44 and verse 18. And you can drop down to 18 to 34. And so God was, God, sorry, God was the first son of Leah's uh, handmaid and also had a place of leadership among the sons of the concubines. Asher was the second son of Zilpha and Leah's handmaid, which was Leah's handmaid. Naphtali was the second son of Bilha and Rachel's handmaid. And Manasseh was the older son of Joseph who was Rachel's older son. And so before Jacob died, he adopted Joseph's son, who were Ephraim and Manasseh, making them equal with the other 11 sons. And this was, of course, his way of guaranteeing the double portion to Joseph. Note that. So Ephraim and Manasseh both became full-fledged tribes of Israel. And when they settled, of course, in the, the, in the land, there, there in, in, in the land of Canaan, Ephraim was given a full portion on the west side of the Jordan uh, and of the Jordan River. And half of the tribe of Manasseh decided to stay on the east side of the Jordan. And so on the other half was given a portion on the west side. So that was the dividing up of their portion. Right? And so there were two uh, course, half tribes of Manasseh Although altogether they were a full tribe. So there were two half tribes, but altogether they were a full tribe. Notice Simeon and Levi, they were the second and third sons of Leah. Issachar was her fifth son. And during the division of the land under Joshua, Simeon was given land within Judah's territory. Uh, Joshua chapter 19 and verse 9. 
So note, my friend, the tribe of Simeon has its own place, distinct from any connection with Judah. And of course, Levi is listed here as one of the tribes. And of course, that is significant, very significant. So under the Old Covenant, the tribe of Levi was singled out to represent the other 12 tribes in service in the sanctuary. It was never allotted a separate tribal territory, but was given cities among the other tribes. Joshua chapter 21, verse 1 to uh, 42 right they were not numbered among the 12 tribes of israel numbers chapter 2 and verse number 33 so in this ceiling the levites take their place with the other tribes notice they are singled out as the priestly tribe that's the levite they're singled out as the priestly tribe here and this of course sealing occurs uh, again under the, the 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 new covenant so the old covenant was obsolete according to hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 so levi is in in uh, included and of course and of he's not only included, but he's included also in the distribution. Uh, notice 12,000 of them, like the, uh, the tribe of the, which is the tribe of the sum total of 144,000. The tribe of Dan was left out, but it was the only tribe that did not the only tribe that did not claim its assigned inheritance in the notice in that promised uh, uh, land, only tribe, right? Their portion was on the edge of the Philistines territory. That's where their portion was. Since the Philistines became uh, too warlike, right, the Danites went north and they found a place, uh, Lashes, which was east to the captives, and there they built their own city, which they named Dan. According to Judges chapter 18, verse 27 to 29, and then the two, of course, they then turned to idolatry. But nevertheless, Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 1 sees the restoration for them. Even though they went to idolatry, they saw there that there would be restoration for that tribe called Dan. Zebulun, right, descended from the youngest son of Leah and is followed by tribes right descended from the sons of Rachel and Joseph and Benjamin and since uh, Joseph's son Manasseh has already been listed it must be that Ephraim is recognized as this uh, serving the name of Joseph example the tribe of Joseph. So notice, this would correspond to Jacob's action when Joseph brought his sons before Jacob for blessing. Right? The elderly gentleman and said, uh, uh, who would uh, uh, Jacob, and he was, of course, he was elderly and he was blind, but he was prepared to adopt Ephraim and Manasseh as full sons when Joseph placed Manasseh, the eldest opposite Jacob's right hand, and Ephraim opposite 
Jacob's left hand. Jacob crossed. I think you will remember that. Jacob crossed his arms, placing his right hand on the head of Ephraim. Notice that. And his left hand on the head of Manasseh. And then he blessed them. And of course, this is free Joseph. And of course, he tried to move Jacob's right hand to Manasseh, but Jacob refused. God was all in it. It was all in the sovereign act of God. And of course, he knew what he was doing. Jacob knew what he was doing. Right? Proceeding to prophesy, right, that Ephraim would be greater than Manasseh. As it's found in Genesis chapter 48, verse 5, and then you can drop down to verse 19. In the course of Israel's history, this proved to be very true. For, the, for Ephraim became not only right, the leading uh, Joseph tribe, but also the leader of all the northern tribes as well so that the nation of northern israel was sometimes referred to as ephraim and ephraim of course deserved to be sealed and deserved to be called the tribe of joseph so though of course the smallest tribe benjamin like the others he has twelve thousand sealed and the multitude before the, the throne is what we are going to go at now. Okay, make another heading. The multitude before the throne. Chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Here what it says. And John said, And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white uh, robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb so notice that so you make a heading call multitude before the throne so in the second vision of, of, of this interlude, you notice that the scene changes from earth to heaven. There's a change in scene. The change, scene changes from earth to heaven. And John sees a great multitude, countless thousands of people from every nation, from every tribe and people and language standing before God's throne. And the Greek word translated nation there is also translated Gentiles. So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word goy is the same word for nation. And that is applied there and then. It is applied, my friends, to the Gentiles, but it's also it's a, it's also applied to Israel. For example, in Psalm 33 and verse 12, "Blessed is the nation," and Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 9, right? My people, Israel was and is a people; she's not left out. So my people, Israel was, I said, and is a people, and she's not left out. Everyone in the multitude, sir, uh, madam, is clothed in long flowing white robes. Notice that which indicates that they share the righteousness of Christ. Like Abraham, their faith has been counted for righteousness. And the Greek word used here is the same as that used 
for white robes of the martyrs who were under the altar in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11. It reminds us also of the white clothing promised to the victors in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice the palm branches in the hands of the multitude symbolize victory and show that they share in his triumph. And so the great multitude before the throne cries out in unison and in total harmony, salvation to our God and unto the Lamb. Know that. And that is salvation belongs to our God as the only source and to the Lamb as the only one who could pay the price and, and make salvation available to all of us. Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross of Calvary, made salvation available to all of us. And they were saying or singing this, and then they, and then, of course, it gives a, a praise to God, right? So they were singing, and they were saying, and right, that they give praise to Almighty God, and God the Father who was on the throne, and to the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne. And they were saying, what salvation to our God. It is a Hebristic uh, expression found in Psalm chapter 3 and verse 8. They kept crying out their praise. They kept ringing out their praise to Almighty God. That is what John heard. So you can make another heading. Angels join in praising God. Chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts. And they fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. What were they saying? Saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So there they were, angels joined in praising God. So John sees an outer circle of thousands of angels. And of course, the, 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 the Greek uh, perfect tense shows that they had already taken their stand around the throne outside of the 24 elders and the four living beings or the four living creatures. So they are all prostrate right before the throne. The angels join in the elders and the living creatures as they do what? As they worship Almighty God. They were there in worship to Almighty God. And of course, these angels are created beings who have never sinned or who have always served God. And they are in an outer circle. Notice it is the multitude of people and everyone who has sinned and has come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Right? Notice that. And who are before the throne and inside the circle, they have white robes and they possess the righteousness of Christ. And that they have the intimacy. Notice that they have very intimate there with the Lord and the angels do not for one moment the angels do not at all for one moment enter into it. these angels are not able to join in the song of the redeemed that is 
of course, applied only to the thousands. And they are full of praise to Almighty God for His wisdom and for His power and for His grace. Angels cannot sing the song of redemption. These angels join in worship with all others around the throne, singing in notice in the vision. And they sing, Amen. Blessings, praise, and glory, not only to the wisdom shown in creation, but of course the wisdom shown by Almighty God in carrying out his great plan of redemption belonging to our God forever and ever. And so, there it is. They got to do anything else but bow and worship before Almighty God. You can make another head in the multitude is identified. Verse 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, uh, What are these? So he's asking, what are these? Hmm? Who are red and white? Or who are these who are red and white? Hmm? And whence came they? And I said unto them, John said, said unto them, Sir, thou knowest, uh-huh. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the question was, was asked and the answer was given. These are they who have washed their robes. So the multitude there identified. Who are these? Multitude, who are they? <laughs> who are they? Who are they? In fact, one of the elders, as a representative of the church, right, he comes over to John. Notice, and he asks John, Who are these clothed in those long white robes? And where did they come from? And John submits that they are the the, that the elders knows. So are you down west? And so the elder tells me, so I'll know for sure who they are. And these are they that are coming out of great tribulation, even in John's own days. And of course, others see, see it as referring to all those saved during that period, the entire church age. So they could have been coming out of thing, or those who were saved during the entire church age. And of course, they understand the phrase, great tribulation, to be Hebristic, Hebristic, and of course, a way of saying long tribulation. These are they who have come out of long tribulation. Since the Hebrew word for great uh, can also mean long or tall, right? Or very, very onerous tribulation. Real test in time that they have come out of. So it's a, of course, it appeals to Jesus. Uh, notice a statement that in the world, in the age you shall have tribulation, a word that of course includes pressure. Remember Jesus said it in John 16, 33, in the world you shall have tribulation, you shall have pressure, you shall have suffering, you shall have persecution. I said John 16, 33, and you compare it with Acts chapter 14, verse 22. And Romans chapter 12, verse 12. And 2 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 4. And uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4 and verse 2. 
and Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, and Revelation 1, 9, and Revelation 2, 9. So notice the great multitude would be the whole number of the redeemed who have finished their time of testing on earth, and now they stand before Almighty God. And of course, others take it to mean that these people are just coming out of the great tribulation. Uh, immediately before the breaking of the seventh seal. And this view indicates that this vision is of the time of the end. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, and you compare it with Daniel 12 and verse 1. These people in the vision, while on earth, did put their faith in Christ and they accepted his redemptive work uh, on the cross of Calvary. The Bible does not uh, say that they are all martyrs. What is clear is that they are all born-again believers. That seems to be very clear. And I conclude by saying, as I come to conclude, serving God forever. Chapter 7, 15 and 16. Chapter 7, 15 and 16. You know what it says? Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Ah, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun lighten them, nor any heat. Notice that sun shall not lighten them, nor any heat. What a time that is going to be. Right? So they are serving God forever. Chapter 7, 15 to 16 I've read. So this multitude is clothed in long white robes of Christ's righteousness. They are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Notice they are continually before the throne. They are all there before the throne, giving worship and adoration to Almighty God. So they are right there before the throne of God. Their sins have all been forgiven, nothing between them and the Savior. And day and night, they continually serve God, as I said, and worship Him in the Holy of Holies. They never cease to praise and adore Him, Almighty God. And notice they have become the fulfillment of what God wanted when He called Israel and, of course, the church to be a holy nation to be a nation of king priests unto Almighty God for him. And notice that God on the throne continually dwells among them and spreads his tent over them. According to uh, ex uh, uh, it's Exodus uh, uh, chapter 4, 48 verse 30. Oh, oh. So what is that? I can't make it out. I may have to tell you later. God dwells in their midst and then He spreads His glory over them. He will shelter and protect them. The Shekinah mean continual dwelling. His glory, the Shekinah. And notice. As I close, the lamb can make the last heading. The lamb, yeah? Their shepherd, verse 17, the lamb, their shepherd, verse 17. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them 
unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. To the Lamb in the midst of the throne, notice that sharing the power and the authority ah, of the one who is on the throne, the one who will do what? The one who will feed or shepherd them by living fountains. Oh yes, the lamb shall lead them and feed them and shepherd them and bring in an end to the world system and to the reign and even a end to the reign of the antichrist he will not drive them how will he do he will lead them he will guide them and the waters of life will forever abundantly satisfy them so he's going to lead them he will guide them and the waters of earth will abundantly satisfy them so at the end of the tribulation period that's what it is my friend god will lead and guide and shepherd and protect and he will forever and abundantly satisfy his people he's your satisfying portion today i trust you enjoy the word of the lord next week we take up chapter 8 but at this point i want to encourage you be with us in our worship service bethel at 7 a.m and we are going to have this bethany church their service is going to be a better it's there every sunday now it's going to be at 7 a.m so we can join that early morning service it's cool and balmy Join a cool and balmy service at 7 a.m. And of course, if you belong to Bethel, well, then come for 10. Don't join that service. Leave that for the unsaved and others. Come for 10 a.m. Again, where we would be gathering around the table of the Lord. It's going to be our communion service. It's third Sunday. We look forward to that. Join the church and the Sunday school and Zoom. They're going to be on Zoom on Sunday evening at uh, what, at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Uh, join the youth ministries on Friday night. Zoom again. And that they have been really attracting a big crowd. 30, 40. Wow. And we pray that. And very interactive. And I tell you, they are the young people are enjoying it. So be with us. Be with us. If you don't have a home church, we would love you to come to Bethel where the Spirit of God is moving, where God is blessing, and God is moving by His Spirit. Oh, we long to see you with us. We thank those who have been visiting with us. Come, bring the whole family. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray your blessings upon your people. Continue to watch and over us and strengthen us today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.